Okay, got it. All right. So um, without further ado, I shall introduce our first speaker, who is Josro gobadi Far uh, from uh, the Department of Geoscience at Virginia Tech in the US. Um, that's why we have the time uh, this morning at 10, so it's not quite too late for Josro. Um, Josro received his master's in geodesy in 2012 in Tehran, in Iran and did his PhD in 2020 at the University of Newcastle, Australia, with the thesis entitled Analysis of Time Variable Signals from GRACE Data. Um, his uh, seminar today is entitled um, New Developments in Earth System Mass Change Observation from Space, Monitoring of Extreme Events. Over to you, Josro. So let me share my screen. So do you see my screen? Yes. That's good. So I don't know if you're speaking or not, but we can't hear anything. So Okay, shall I start? Do you hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear you. I think okay. I can hear you as well. Dora, I can hear you too. Yeah, Dora, it must be some something wrong with your speaker. Get you can't hear us? Um. Ah, so maybe it's me. Okay, good. Then so may I? go for it. Okay. May I start now? Um, yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so the title of my talk is New Development in Air System Mass Chain Observation from a Space Monitoring of Extreme Events. My talk has three parts. In the first part, I will give a short introductory talk on monitoring of water resources in Australia using satellite altimetry and satellite gravimetry. In the second part, I will focus only on satellite gravimetry from GRACE and GRACE follow-on. I have developed a new approach for GRACE data processing in the past few years. This new approach is especially suitable for monitoring of extreme rapidly changing processes like floods, cyclones, tsunamis. Since this is a joint seminar between RSCS and FENER, I will present geophysical as well as hydrological application based on this new approach that I have developed. I will end with potential application of this new approach along with other satellite data for monitoring of Australia's water resources. So let's start. We all know that water is a rare commodity in Australia. This is because Australia has access to only about 1% of global freshwater resources. Most of Australia's population, agriculture and industry are in the southern coastal regions of Australia, like in Sydney and Melbourne, while more than half of the water runoffs occur in northern parts of Australia in tropical and subtropical areas. Moreover, only five to 10% of Australia's national rainfall reaches streams, water storage, and groundwater aquifers, and the rest is evaporated. In fact, the situation may get even worse in the future. For example, surface water resources may become less available in the future due to climate change and prolonged droughts. So there's an urgent need for monitoring of water resources in Australia. And when it comes to water resources management, Sorry, there's an urgent need for management of water resources in Australia. And when it comes to water resources management, one of the most important aspects is being able to monitor the availability of water resources and also the changes over time. In Australia, surface water and groundwater are the main source of drinking water. They are also the main source for irrigation, agriculture, and industrial use. For example, according to Geoscience Australia in WA, groundwater currently supplies about two thirds of the state's entire water requirements. So in this short lecture, we will see how satellite data can be used to monitor, to monitor the changes in surface water and groundwater in Australia. Surface water, by which I mean water in lakes, reservoirs, and rivers can be monitored using satellite altimetry technique and groundwater can be monitored using satellite gravimetry technique. So let's start with satellite altimetry. Altimeter satellites measure the time taken for a radar pulse to travel from the satellite to the sea surface and back to the satellite. This measured time can be easily converted into the distance of the satellite to the sea surface. Altimetry satellites are also equipped with GPS to measure the location of the satellite along the orbit. 
Now let's see how these measurements can be used to determine the sea level or lake level. So distance of the satellite to a reference level is equal to the distance of satellite to the sea surface plus the lake level or sea level above the reference level. We know that the GPS gives us the distance of the satellite from the reference level and the altimeter sensor measures the distance of the satellite to the sea surface. Therefore, in order to get the sea surface height or lake level height, we simply subtract blue from the red. Now I will show you two examples of satellite altimetry observations of lake levels in Australia, Lake Argyle and Lake Mackay near the eastern border of WA. <coughs> So this figure shows the variations in water level of Lake Makai and Lake Arga. In the case of Lake Makai, you see that range of variation is about half a meter, but in the case of Lake Argyle, the variations are as large as seven meter. We also see a clear seasonal signal in this case. If we have access to lake bathymetry, which we do in most cases, these observations, satellite altimetry observations, can be used to estimate the volume of water available in these lakes. Now let's move to the second technique, which is satellite gravimetry. We all know that Earth gravity field is not constant. It changes from one region to the other. This is because different regions on Earth, like oceans and mountains, have different densities and therefore different masses. If we remove a reference level, a reference value from the Earth's gravity, we will be able to see the significant variabilities in different regions as you see in these two figures. But over the same region, Earth gravity field changes with time. This is simply because gravity is related to mass and if the mass of an object changes, its gravity will also change with time. In the case of Earth, most, almost all of the mass change happening near the Earth's surface is caused by water. And by water, I mean water in all its forms, oceans, ice sheet, glaciers, soil moisture, etc. So Earth's gravity field changes from one month to the other due to the mass of water moving around the Earth on and near the surface of the Earth. GRACE and GRACE follow-on satellite missions have been measuring these changes in Earth gravity field caused by the water moving around the Earth. So GRACE mission was functional from 2002 to 2017, and currently we have GRACE follow-on. GRACE and GRACE follow-on are very similar satellite missions. Each includes two satellites at the altitude of 500 kilometer. They follow each other at a distance of about 200 kilometer in a polar orbit. Each satellite is equipped with a GPS receiver to measure the location of the satellite along the orbit, and the, also the distance between the two satellites is measured by an intersatellite tracking sensor. The distance between two satellites changes because the gravitational pull of the masses below the satellites. So this animation clearly shows how GRACE and GRACE follow-on work. So basically, when the satellites approach a mass anomaly like an ice cap, because the gravitational field changes because of the mass change, the distance between the two satellites changes. If we track the distance change between two satellites over the same region over time, let's say five or 10 years, we will be able to track the mass change that is causing this change in the in the intersatellite data. So GRACE data are given in the form of monthly estimate of total water storage changes. This monthly estimate of total water storage are simply estimated from one month of intersatellite data after removing the effect of Earth's static gravity. This figure here shows the total water storage change in Australia in the first six months of 2020. So in this figure, blue means positive water storage and red means negative water storage. By comparing these monthly snapshots of water storage, we are able to track the changes. For example, if you compare the map of January with that of March, you will see a change from a negative to a positive water storage. Now let's see how GRACE data can be used to estimate groundwater storage. GRACE observations of total water storage are basically the summation of surface water, soil moisture, snow water, and groundwater storage. So simply in order to get the groundwater storage, we need to subtract these components of water storage from the GRACE observed total water storage. Hydrological models like WGHM and GLDAS provide us 
with estimates of these components. I'd like to note that hydrological models like WGHM also provide groundwater storage, but the thing is that the groundwater storage from the model is not reliable at all. So in this slide here, I show the groundwater storage changes in the state of Victoria in Australia using grays from 2003 to 2013. So from 2000, so the red and green are grays observations of groundwater storage after removing other components like soil moisture based on the WGHM and GH and GLDAS hydrological models. So from 2003 to 2010, press observed a negative trend in the groundwater storage in Victoria. This is related to the long-term trot during this period. Starting from 2010, we see an increase in the groundwater storage. This increase was caused by the heavy rainfall associated with the La Nina from 2010 to 2012. Comparison of the grace observations of groundwater storage with those from ground level, from groundwater bore observations, which you see in this figure here, validates the reliability and accuracy of the waste estimates of groundwater storage. So to conclude, using two simple examples, we saw how satellite altimetry and gravimetry and satellite gravimetry can be used to monitor the variation in surface water and groundwater in Australia. Such satellite data provide valuable and critical information which can be used and should be used for management of Australia's water resources. And this is all to ensure ongoing water access in the future. So this was the end of the first part. The presented application that I just showed you for monitoring on groundwater storage was based on the conventional or standard data processing of GRACE. This standard data processing has some limitations that I will tell you in a minute about. I have developed a new approach which can overcome this limitation and is perfectly suitable for monitoring of extreme, rapidly changing processes like floods and tsunamis. So I will present the approach first and then some geophysical and hydrological application based on this new approach. I don't wanna repeat what I said about GRACE. I just want to emphasize again that the principal observation that allows grace and grace follow on to measure changes in Earth's gravity due to mass change is this intersatellite tracking data. In the case of grace, a microwave-based system called KBR was measuring the intersatellite distances. And for grace follow on, we have two sensors, a microwave-based sensor called KBR and a laser-based sensor called LRR. And the accuracy of laser is much higher than that of the microwave-based sensor. So what you would find as official data product of GRACE and GRACE follow-on project from NASA and other agencies are the monthly snapshots of air surface mass change. This monthly snapshot of air surface mass change are estimated from one month of intersatellite tracking data. So this, in this figure here, you see the monthly snapshot during the grace period from 2002 to 2017. By comparing this monthly snapshot, we are able to track the changes in the mass change. For example, in the figure in the right, you see the Greenland's mass change from 2002 to 2016. You see a clear seasonal signal, but also a, a steady negative trend. This negative trend indicates the ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet diminishing due to climate change. Here in this slide, I show the trend of the monthly data of grace from 2002 to 2016. So here the red means negative mass change and blue means positive mass change. The cause of the mass change in different region in this map is different. For example, it could be due to natural, natural variability. For example, in the eastern part of Australia, where we see a positive change in water storage, this indicates the progression from dry to wet period mostly related to the La Nina from 2010 to 2012. Or the cause could be climate change. For example, ice sheets, Greenland ice sheets, and the ice sheet in the Western Antarctic are diminishing due to climate change. Or it could be due to groundwater depletion, for example, in California. 
all the processes that you see in this figure happen on the time scale of seasonal to interannual. And indeed, this is the fundamental and obvious limitation of this official monthly data. They are perfect for studying slowly varying processes with seasonal to interannual variability. However, we know that there's substantial high frequency variability in the Earth system happening at the time at the sump mostly time scale. For example, at the time scales of days or weeks. These high frequency mass changes are caused by extreme rapid processes like floods, cyclones, tsunamis, Earth's free oscillation, etc. If you use monthly data, you cannot study these fast processes, obviously. But this is not an inherent limitation of the grace. This is rather caused by this monthly sampling of the data that we use. We can overcome this limitation by going back and looking what actually grace measures, which is intersatellite tracking. So this is the solution that I have put forward in the past few years to directly analyze this, the distance, the intersatellite distance. The perturbations in the intersatellite range are caused by Earth's gravity, non-gravitational forces like air drag, plus multiple time variable effects due to, for example, changes in terrestrial water storage, ice sheet mass change, ocean mass change, etc. So we remove the effect of Earth's static gravity and non-gravitational forces to obtain range residuals, intersatellite range residuals denoted by delta rho. These intersatellite range residuals reflect the instantaneous gravity change caused by instantaneous mass change beneath the satellites. For example, when satellites are flying above Australia, the perturbation in delta rho reflects the mass change beneath the satellites. I'd like to note that these intersatellite range residuals are geometric quantities and they require sophisticated orbit integration for their processing. Only a handful of institutions in the world have the capability to, to do this kind of processing. For example, in Australia, only Paul Tregoning's group has the capability to handle this data. In, or in order to make this kind of processing easier, we express the intersatellite data in terms of gravimetric quantity. So basically, in situ gravity change along the satellite orbits <clears throat> Sorry, is the second time derivative of range residual. So the first derivative gives us the velocity and the second one gives us acceleration or gravity. These in situ gravity changes are called line of sight gravity difference or LGD and they are expressed in terms of nanometer per second square. This gravity quantity LGD is the one that I use in the rest of my presentation for various applications. I'd like to note that in our convention in geodesy, a positive mass change in, at the Earth's surface is reflected as a negative gravity change at satellite altitude and vice versa. So here, I'd like to demonstrate this concept of instantaneous gravity at satellite altitude versus monthly map at the Earth's surface. So in the figure in the left, uh, the spatial map shows the monthly mean of soil moisture plus the monthly mean of surface water in the April of 2020. I selected three ground tracks from the GRACE follow-on. These are the so-called repeat ground tracks, which mean that the satellites fly above the same region in different days of 7th, 18th, and 29th of April. Therefore, if we see a change in the intersatellite measurement, this is caused by the temporal change, not the spatial change, because obviously the satellites were flying above the same region in the three days. So the figure in the right shows the gravitational measurements by the <coughs> laser sensor of grace following. So in this figure, the x-axis shows the gravitational changes and the y-axis is latitude. First of all, from the latitude of zero to minus 15, where we have a positive water storage change in April, we see a large negative gravity change measured by laser. Second, if you look at this figure, you will see that laser measurements on April 7th, shown in green, are different from those on April 29th in blue. This means that the GRACE follow-on laser sensor observed the sub-monthly mass change 
in April. So if you use the monthly map, a monthly snapshot, you will lose the sub-monthly variation in the Earth's mass. So basically, this new way of data processing that I'm advocating for is based on this long orbit gravity data, while the conventional approach is using a monthly map. So now I will show you three examples based on this new approach. The first one is about tsunamis. So on December 26 of 2004, a catastrophic tsunami generated by the Sumatra earthquake was generated in the Indian oceans. This tsunami killed more than 200,000 people. Gray satellites flew over the tsunami waves about one hour and 15 minutes after the earthquake. So in the figure in the right, I show the gray's gravitational measurements at 500 kilometer altitude in red. In this figure, the x-axis is latitude and the y-axis is gravitational changes in terms of nanometer per second squared. Then I used two tsunami models based on two different earthquake sources and computing synthetic gravity at grace altitude. This synthetic gravity from two tsunami models are shown in blue and black. So first of all, the agreement between observations and models confirms the GRACE observation of tsunami. Secondly, and more importantly, you can see that GRACE is able to distinguish among tsunami models with different sources. This means that GRACE gravitational observation can be used to constrain the tsunami or earthquake source. This work demonstrated the first ever gravitational observation of tsunamis from space. <coughs> So the second example is about GRACE follow-on monitoring of Bangladesh flood during the 2020 monsoon season. About 80% of the annual rainfall in Bangladesh happens during the monsoon season from June to October. By the end of the monsoon season, about two-thirds of the country is underwater. In order to understand the dynamics of flooding in Bangladesh, we looked at the GRACE follow-on laser data. So the figure in the left shows the ascending race follow-on ground tracks in June, July, and August of 2020. And the magenta line here shows the Bangladesh border. The laser gravitational measurements corresponding to these ground tracks are shown in the figure in the right. In this figure, again, the x-axis shows the gravitational changes and the y-axis is latitude. So first of all, if you look from South Pole to North Pole, you see that the largest gravitational variability in these three months happen around the latitude of 25, where Bangladesh is located. Secondly, you see that in the early June to mid-June, we have a positive gravity change indicating negative water storage change. But as we move towards July and August, we see the emergence of large negative gravitational changes. This large negative changes in gravity indicate the positive water storage caused by heavy rainfall during the monsoon season. Grace follow-on laser observed the largest negative gravity changes in late July, and it's about 14 nanometer per second square. So these gravitational changes are caused in this latitude band are caused by soil moisture plus surface water in Bangladesh. We remove the effect of soil moisture using the GLDAS model and use the remaining gravity signal to understand the dynamics of surface water, basically the velocity of a stream flow velocity in Bangladesh. We simulate the surface water by routing the GLDAS runoff with various stream flow velocities of 10, 40, and 90 centimeter per second. Then using this simulated surface water, we compute synthetic gravity at the grace follow-on altitude and compare with the measurements, gravitational measurements from laser sensor. So in this figure in the right, the color curve shows the measurements, observations from laser sensor, and the black one shows synthetic gravity from different surface water simulated with different velocities. As you can see in July of 2020, Grace follow-on laser favors the velocity of 40 centimeter per second. This simple result showed that by directly using the gravity from laser, we can 
without and without doing any inversion to get the water storage in at the air surface, we can use the gravity detector directly to constrain the runoff routing model and the stream flow velocity. So in the next step, we quantify the temporal evolution of flood mass or flood volume in Bangladesh from May to August. To do that, we invert the intersatellite laser data and estimate flood mass whenever grace follow-on satellites were flying above Bangladesh. So these circles here show the flood mass in terms of gigaton. So this is the flood mass in gigaton from overpass laser data of grace follow-on. You see that starting from late May or early June, the flood mass starts to increase. And as we go towards July, we see a rapid increase in flood mass. The flood mass reaches its peak. In late July, the peak value is about 70 gigaton. So it means that in just a couple of months, Bangladesh was flooded with 70 gigaton of water. And just for your information, one gigaton is about one kilometer cubed of water. So this is huge amount of water. And as we go from July to August, we see a slow decrease in the flood mass over Bangladesh. To show the limitation of monthly data, the official monthly data, these black triangles here, show the flood mass estimated from monthly solution of gray. So this one is the monthly flood mass from monthly solution of June. And this one is the flood mass from monthly solution of July. As you see, the monthly, the official monthly data failed to capture the fast temporal evolution of flooding in Bangladesh. And indeed, this is the limitation that, that I'm trying to explain here of this official. The third and last example is about high frequency ocean variability in the Gulf of Carpentaria. In 2019, from January 23rd to February 7th, a low pressure system caused heavy rainfall and flooding in Queensland. The surface wind associated with this low pressure system caused substantial oceanic variability in the Gulf of Carpentaria. To study this event, I selected all the descending tracks from the grace follow-on during this period. The laser measurements corresponding to these ground tracks are shown in the figure in the right. Again, here the x-axis shows the gravitational changes and the y-axis shows latitude. So near the latitude of Gulf of Carpentaria, grace laser sensor measured substantial gravitational variability with different location, at different location and with different sizes, which indicates the high frequency mass variability in GOC during this period. Then I use output from an ocean model and I computed synthetic gravity at the grace following altitude. So the black lines here shows the synthetic gravity from an ocean model and the color ones show the laser observation. As you see, the two agree quite well. So I am currently helping the German Geoscience Research Center, GFZ, to validate their ocean model using the laser data from Grace Follower. So my aim is to introduce a new data product for the Grace Follower mission using the laser data. It will be called LGD LRI. LGD indicates the gravimetric nature of this data, and LRI means they are from the laser sensor. So as I showed in the three examples, LGD LRI are gravity measurements at satellite altitude, which reflect the instantaneous mass change happening beneath the satellites. And the reason that you I use laser instead of microwave data is that I recently showed that the laser data are one order of magnitude more accurate compared to the microwave data. So my aim in introducing this new data product for the GRACE follow-on project is to push the limit of GRACE follow-on to broaden the scope of geophysical and hydrological application that can be studied with GRACE follow-on. The GRACE month, GRACE and GRACE follow-on monthly, official monthly data already contributes significantly to our understanding of interannual mass variability in the area system. For example, ice sheet diminishing or ocean rising due to climate change. 
both these applications have been exhausted in the past 10 or 20 days. I think it's time to open some new opportunities using the data from Grace and Grace for them. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that climate change is expected to largely worsen the frequency, intensity, and impact of some extreme event log floods. So this new data product has the potential to become more relevant in the future. So now I come to the last part, which I briefly mentioned some potential application of this new approach along with other satellite data for Australia's water resources. So any change in water storage in Australia, for example, change in soil moisture or groundwater causes a gravity change. This gravity change is measured by inter-satellite data whenever GRACE and GRACE follow-on are flying or were flying above that region. But that change in water storage also causes a deformation signal, which is measured by GNSS and insert techniques. Changes in the soil moisture are measured by the SMOS and SMAP satellites, and also changes in the height and area of surface waters is measured by satellite altimetry, as I showed, and the change in area is measured with the satellite emergency radar. So all these satellite data can be assimilated at the observation level into a hydrological model using a Kalman filter framework. And the result would be accurate water storage components like soil moisture, like groundwater at high spatial temp and temporal resolution. The high temporal resolution will be achieved by combining all the data sets. And by high temporal resolution, I mean sub monthly time scale. And this is achievable because we are using the satellite the data as they are, that's why I hear I read at the observation level. So GRACE and GRACE follow-on are used in, the term of, in terms of instantaneous inter-satellite tracking. Deformation data are used, for example, daily deformation from GNSS and INSAR. So using all these satellite data, one can develop an integrated space-based monitoring system and couple it with hydrological model to track the water resources, their availability, and their changes over time in Australia. This time slot did not allow me to cover all the topics that I have worked on in the past few years. I only selected three of them that could be fitted into this scheme of long track gravity data analysis. If you are interested, you can check my other publications. With this, I would like to end my talk and thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Hosro. Um, oh, it's, uh, oh, should I like, I don't know, stop sharing my screen or? Oh, well, we'll see how we go. Stop sharing oh, okay. your screen for now. And I think the questions that will come will probably um, prompt okay. you to uh, show one or the other slide that you have shown before. So I'll um, open the floor for questions, please. So I've got some in the uh, chat here as well as, uh, so you're welcome to raise your hand and speak, but uh, I've got one in the chat here by Gemma Jeffrey, uh, who asked, what is the spatial resolution of the instantaneous data? Oh, so in the case of laser, the sample is, is two seconds and the velocity of grace and grace following satellite is about eight kilometer per second. So that's about, for laser is about, 15 kilometers, so every 15 kilometer in the along track direction, we have one measurement. In the case of microwave data, it's five seconds. So it's about 40 to 50 kilometers in the along track direction. Okay, thanks. There is, uh, Thank you. There is, is this Brad raising his hand? Opdike? Yeah. yeah my, my question is related to that because some of the, the basins we look at around Canberra or groundwater mm -hmm. is would be, I don't know, probably less than 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. Mm -hmm. would, would you be able to, to actually, is that resolution too small? For you yes. To yeah. So the one kind of misunderstanding about GRACE and GRACE fall could be that, so it doesn't really depend on the size, right? So GRACE and GRACE, it measures mass change right so if the area is a small but the mass change is big enough you are able to 
analyze that basin, observe the mass change in that basin using grace and grace follow on. As I showed, for example, in the case of Bangladesh, Bangladesh is much larger, but still it is much smaller than the native resolution of the grace, which is about three to 500 kilometers. But since the mass change is large, you can yeah, detect it and analyze it with grace. So it depends on this mass change of the signal. And if it's not, if the grace by itself cannot do it, so we can combine it, for example, with satellite altimetry data or the hydrological models and try to update the, for example, hydrological models using this grace and grace follow-on data whenever satellites are flying above that region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I suppose, I suppose what I'm trying to get at there is, is just how, how small can you go, really? Because often, often the changes we see in the groundwater resources are not large and they're declining. So I guess I want to, I guess I, I guess I just want to sort of tease out how, could, could you see a couple meters of, of groundwater uh, drop? No, a couple of meter, meters, no. But like, for example, a famous example is Central Valley in California. So the width is about 100 kilometers, which is much smaller than the native resolution of Brace. But during the last drought period from 2012 to 2015, because of the rate of the groundwater extraction was so high, so the mass change was so large that you can easily see it with grace. Right. So it, Thank you very much. Let's say 50, 100 kilometers now. Okay, I've got Andy Hawk next and then. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a quick question about the validation of ocean models. Um, uh -huh. You mentioned you you validating the uh, the German model in yeah. the Gulf of Carpentaria. What were you looking at? Is it just sea surface height? Can you say anything about the interior structure of the ocean from the gravity measurements? Um, or or is and and are you looking at tidal frequencies or are you looking at lower frequencies? No. So it's high. Free, so we remove the all the tidal signal from the gravity data. So the gravity data that you see is already reduced by the tidal. So this is high frequency, non-tidal ocean variability. Okay, in interior or just surface height, effectively? No, it's, it's the whole thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also, for example, in this new version of their model, which is OCMT, we are including, for example, loading effects, self-attraction, right? So these effects are so small. You, they cannot like validate it with other observation, but the laser data is so accurate that all those, yeah, those small changes could be validated. So that's what we are trying to do with the people in GFZ or colleague in GFZ. Thanks. Nerali. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I've had two questions. So um, I just wanted to get a feel for um, how quickly you go from sort of measuring the data to having something that's usable. Like, is this something that could be used for like real time monitoring of drought risk um, when the, that sort of soil moisture is starting to, to decrease? Um, and then the, the second part of the question was, so what's the time frame that the GRACE mission is expected to, to run for and, um, and what this current GRACE mission um, and what do you see as sort of coming after that? Yep. So for the first question, the official data are released about two to three months after they are measured, but our colleagues at JPL, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they have this quick release data. They have this quick, they call it quick look data that they can release to people in the community, right? For example, there was like this earthquake and tsunami last year in Kermodek. So I was hoping and trying to see if the laser data could pick up the tsunami wave. For example, I contacted a colleague at JPL and they, I don't know, just after one day or so, they, yeah, so they provided with all the data. So us like in the community have access quickly, just in one or two days to the data and to the second question. So the grace, Satellites were functional for about 15 years and GRACE follow-on was launched in 2018. So let's say at least hopefully by 2030. And the next missions are basically similar to GRACE, but since different countries are trying to contribute this satellite gravimetry. So for example, people like in European Space Agency or Chinese Space Agency, so they are thinking about launching a 
rays like mission but with inclined orbit right so we have one with the polar orbit and let's say if we get two with inclined orbit we will be able to increase the spatial the coverage right so we for example instead of covering the whole earth like in a month with one satellite pair we will be able to cover the whole earth with different ground tracks in just 10 or 15 days and increase the accuracy and spatial resolution but basically it's the future is grace yeah, so, yeah, and with laser, so not with my problem. Thank you. We've got a small question here from Gemma still um, on the chat, in the chat, uh, whether you happen to capture the 2004 tsunami in particular, or would most tsunamis be overflown at some point? Oh, so during the Gerais period, we have three large earthquakes that generated tsunamis that 2004 Sumatra, 20 and 2010 Maoli, Chile, and 2011 Tohoku, Japan. So in all three cases, I was able to show that gray satellites flew over the tsunami waves and measured the gravity changes at 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. So for all the major ones, for the Kermodek last year, that we had so by just one so i checked it grace fall one satellites like flew and tsunami wave arrived there like i don't know half an hour later so i was like oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah so for most of them if it's like in the open ocean for sure you can get one or two overpass so the yeah okay oh thanks brad is this still a question or you just have your hand still up we have still a bit of time for one or two more questions. Well, there don't seem to be more questions. So thank you very much, Rosso. It was um, uh, very interesting for me not being in that field. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we will let you go and enjoy the rest of your day in the States now. Thank you very Thank you much. So much. Right. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. But uh, so welcome, Siwan, today. Um, Siwan um, did her P uh, master's in 2013 in geomatics in, uh, at the University of Melbourne and received her PhD in 2019 in geodesy at the ANU with a thesis entitled Monitoring and Forecasting Drought Through the Assimilation of Satellite Water Observation. As I said before, she is uh, um, working at the Fender School as a postdoctoral fellow. And today she is going to give us a talk on reimagining our water future from space. Please, Tuyan, over to you. Thank you, Dorit, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining my seminar today. And it's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, introduce my wor work to you. And now let me share my screen. Um, my talk today uh, is entitled Reimagining Our Water Future uh, from Space. Um, I will skip this one since you have already heard about my background uh, from Dorit and start straight away. Um, as we all know, water covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface, and it's very easy to think that it will always be plentiful. Um, however, the water that we drink, we irrigated our farm field with, um, is only 3% of the world's water. And climate change is altering patterns of weather and water all around the world, causing the increasing period of drought and flooding and melting glaciers. Rivers and lakes and aquifers are drying up or becoming too polluted to use. Agriculture con consumes more water than any other sources and wastes much of them through inefficiencies. And this situation will only get worse if we continue at the current consumption rate. Therefore, understanding the complex and interlinked nature of global water system is the first step towards a sustainable water world. And to me, 
the real game changer is the satellite Earth observations. Orbiting satellites are now collecting data relatively uh, relevant to all aspects of the uh, global water cycle, such as uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration, uh, condensation, runoff, and etc. But in today's talk, uh, we will focus on one of the key variables that's regulating the water cycle, which is the water stored in the soil, as known as the soil moisture. And in particular, uh, how we can get accurate, up-to-date, and high-resolution soil moisture information for a sustainable water future. The amount of water in the top layer of the soil plays an important role in the physical process that occurs between the land and the atmosphere because it influences the partitioning of the energy um, available at the land uh, uh, into the sensible and latent heat fluxes. And the diagram here shows the feedback loops between the soil moisture, temperature, radiation, as well as uh, precipitations. And the plus and minus here uh, indicates the neg uh, positive and negative feedback loops. And for example, um, increased temperature due to the global warming can lead to a higher atmosphere moisture demand, which then induce the soil drying up and further uh, enhance the initial temperature increase. Uh, in addition, precipitation, uh, uh, the changes in our transpiration may also influence the precipitation via the um, moisture um, input to the uh, atmospheres. Well, precipitation itself uh, can also affect the soil moisture. Therefore, even though the soil moisture is only a very small portion of the total available fresh water, it can have a profound influences on the weather pattern. Um, more directly, as most of the water available to the plants um, through in the forms of soil moisture, and soil moisture availability has a direct impact on the vegetation health and growth. And plants can be wilted because of too much water or not enough water. And this makes soil moisture a key factor to monitor agricultural production and aid irrigation management. Traditionally, soil moisture is measured with on-ground probes or sensors at point scale. And there are a limited number of soil moisture monitoring sites that provide near real-time and public accessible soil moisture observations across Australia, like um, the figure I show here in the middle. Um, however, the spatial pattern of the soil moisture can vary significantly during the different spatial distribution of rainfall, uh, soil properties, uh, different land cover types, topographies, as well as human interventions, such as irrigation, as you can see from this image here. And if we have a look at these two time series here, and uh, you can see the significant difference between um, the surface soil moisture at two locations that actually located only 100 meters away. Therefore, the use of ground-based uh, point scale measurements is limited in understanding the variation of soil moisture in space and time over a large area. Temporally and spatially continuous soil moisture datasets are commonly explored through um, hydrological uh, models or land surface models. Um, the main benefit of having um, the modeling is that it describes the entire system and the relationship between the state variables and the related fluxes. Those two maps here are the example of the model simulated surface soil moisture and runoff. Um, but the accuracy of these simulated soil moisture products are highly dependent on the quality and the availability of the meteorological observations. Uh, so textures, so properties, and other model parameters, as well as the physics of the models that involves. So beyond the ground observations and the
to estimate the soil moisture, avoiding the spatial coverage limitation of the ground-based measurements. And these images here compared uh, three day composites of gauge-based precipitation map in the top against the uh, satellite soil moisture observations uh, across Australia in the bottom. And you can see that from those uh, images on the left, um, the wet spread of the rain over the Queensland caused the saturated, uh, saturated uh, soil. And more importantly, we can see how moisture varies in space and time through the satellite observations. Um, as you can see from the middle ones, that um, there are still water present in the topsoil layer even after three days the rain falls. So now let's have a quick look at how satellite works in collecting data. The diagram here are the essential components of the satellite remote sensing. And the first requirement for remote sensing is to have an energy source which illuminates or provides the electromagnetic energy to the target of interest. And satellite carries sensors that measures the reflected or emitted signal emerging from the top of the atmosphere. And the recorded um, energy uh, is called electromagnetic radiation. And the energy recorded by the sensor has to be transmitted to a receiving and processing station on ground and, the, uh, at, uh, and then processed and interpreted to the digital format and uh, like what we want. And, and the satellite sensors are designed um, to capture a specific range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And different portions of the electronic, uh, electromagnetic spectrum can be broken out according to its frequency or wavelengths, such as uh, gamma rays, visible light, which is what our eyes can see, um, microwaves, and radio waves. Sensors that design for soil moisture monitoring measures the microwave radiation, since uh, it can penetrate through cloud cover, haze, and dust, and this property allows the detection of microwave energy under almost all weather and environmental conditions. Microwave sensing um, contains both passive and active forms. And in, act, uh, in passive micro, uh, remote sensing, the sun is the radiation source. And the passive um, microwave sensor are typically radiometers or scanners that detect the natural um, radiation that is emitted or reflected uh, by the objects. And on the other hand, the active uh, microwave sensors provide their own source of um, microwave radiation to eliminate the target. And it emits uh, the radiation in the direction of the target and then detects the measured and radiation that is reflected or backscattered from the target. And the most common acro active microwave sensors are radars and scarometers. Now let's have a look at two most recent satellite missions that designed for soil moisture uh, mapping. SMOS is the first mission that provides the global uh, of the soil moisture observations together with sea surface salinity using microwave L-band measurements. And L-band is known as the most uh, suitable frequency for the soil moisture monitoring because of the large dielectric contrast between the dry and dry soil and the water. And the sensitivity to the atmospheric disturbance and surface roughness is minimal. SMAP consists of both passive and active sensors, but the radar parts uh, stop working due to the failure of power supply three months after it launched. So it's now operating with the passive sensor only. Both SMOS and SMAP measures the soil moisture at top five centimeters globally every two to three days. And the, measured, um, the measurements uh, is uh, called brightness temperature. 
and the brightness temperature increases with uh, decreasing soil moisture, as shown in this plot. And generally, the passive sensors are capable of providing frequent observations, but with a relatively coarse spatial resolution. Now, uh, let's have a look at two examples of the active sensors. The METOP uh, XCAT series provide the longest consistent uh, global soil moisture data um, from 1991 using the C band measurements. And the penetration depth is a bit shallower compared to the L band. So it only measures the, two, uh, the top two to cent three centimeters. Uh, of the soil. And the Sentinel-1 mission is designed as a two-satellite constellation, and each of them carries a, an advanced radar instrument. That the temporal resolution um, is around 12 days, which is often not sufficient for the soil moisture monitoring, but have a much higher spatial resolution. But the most challenging part for uh, the soil moisture travels from active sensors um, comparing to the passive one is because of the combined effects of the vegetation structure and surface, the surface roughness and the water content on the measured backscattering coefficients. Therefore, um, the microwave, uh, uh, sorry, the soil moisture estimate derived from active sensor always suffers from the noise. Therefore, either a uh, model simulation or satellite observations has their own limitations. And the animations here compares the SMAP soil moisture uh, and the modeled soil moisture. And we can see that these uh, um, soil moisture from land surface model can provide time, uh, temporally and spatially continuous soil moisture. But the accuracy of the simulated soil moisture uh, is highly dependent on the uh, initial conditions, parameters, forcing data sets, and model physics. Satellite soil moisture, on the other hand, can provide accurate soil moisture information instant in time, but with limited spatial coverage uh, each time. So you can see those gaps at the daily measurements from this map data here. And um, another thing is that there is a trade-off between the spatial and temporal resolution from the satellite observations. The passive sensors like SMAP can provide more frequent observations, uh, um, but at a very coarse resolution. Whereas Sentinel-1 has a much better spatial re resolution, but only available every half a month, as you can see from this plot here. Therefore, how can we, uh, how to get an accurate and spatially and temporally comprehensive soil moisture mapping at high resolution is a real challenge. The solution I have for this problem is data simulation. Data simulation uh, works that it combines the observations into a dynamic model using the model equations to provide the time continuity and the coupling between the estimated fields. Data simulation is necessary because um, all model drifts a bit like our cars. So even if you are driving on a perfect straight road, you still need to keep your hands on the steering wheel or you will run off to the edge sooner or later. Data simulation in a model seems the same purpose as the slight movement of your hands that keep your car on course. Since the Earth system is too complicated to be modeled perfectly, um, what we can do is to steer our model forecast using observations to make it towards a greater realism in using a sophisticated mathematical techniques. And there are typically two types of approaches to data simulation the sequential data simulation or retrospective simulation. The sequential simulation is suitable for real-time applications because it uses observation that made in the past until the time of the analysis. 
And in this case here, we can see at any update time, the model forecast, or we can call it backgrounds, is compared with the newly observed observations. And the model state is uh, updated towards the observations based on the errors in both model and the observations. And the updated states, uh, known as the analysis, is then used as the initial condition for the next time step. On the other hand, um, in a retrospective uh, simulation, observations um, from the future can be used, which make it suitable for real analysis applications. Um, as shown in this example, observations over a window, uh, over a period, are used in the state updating. And the corrections uh, to the analyzed states is smooth in time, as you can see, comparing to the sequential approach. And the most popular method in data simulation is the family of the common filter such as the extended common filter or uh, ensemble common filter. And the techniques begins as a way to guide three months to the moon by estimating the race graph trajectory and have since uh, evolved into a valuable tool sites uh, for tackling problems back on Earth. And the common filter works in two steps. The first step is to make uh, model predictions at the current state of the system and the level of uncertainties uh, due to the possible random effects. And this step is known as the predict step. And the second one uses the weighted average to combine the most recently observed uh, measurements with the model predictions. Um, and the weighting is called common gain which considers the uncertainties in both model predictions uh, and uh, observations. And more importantly, the algorithm is recursive. So the corrected model state estimates will be used as the initial estimates for the next time step. By now, I guess you already had some idea about satellite observations and data simulation. I will now uh, demonstrate the value of data simulation in water resources monitoring using two of my recent work, one using sequential approach, another one using retrospective approach. The first one is about uh, simulating uh, satellite soil moisture observation to improve a real-time operational water balance modeling system. assessment model, ORAL, that runs by the Bureau of Meteorology that underpins the annual national water resource assessment and water use accounts for Australia. And the map on the right hand side is the surface soil moisture output from this model. And um, as we can see that the soil moisture over Western Australia and Central Australia are zeros. But this is not because there is no moisture in the field, uh, in the soil. It's because of the error in the rainfall forcing. And the rainfall forcing data that drives this model is a gauge-based rainfall data, as, as you can see from here. Since precipitation is the most important input variable in the system, the accuracy of the soil moisture estimates is then highly dependent on the accuracy of the rainfall forcing. Um, as a result, that and the soil moisture variations at areas where uh, there are insufficient coverage of the rain gauge are estimated poorly, like what I show here. Therefore, what we want is to fill this gap using the satellite observations and to obtain a spatially continuous and accurate soil moisture map for the whole continent like this. And on the other hand, uh, this is also a way to downscale the satellite soil moisture observations with the coarse resolution to be, con to be the same like the model resolution. 
And the model that we developed is a two-step assimilation framework. And the first step is the uh, is a common filter type sequential state updating uh, uh, method for the purpose of real-time updating. And the weighting between the model obs and observations were derived from uh, the triple collocation approach. Satellites map and SMOS were uh, simulated to the system simultaneously to maximize the uh, spatial coverage. And the figure in the bottom shows the relative weighting between the observations and model forecasts that derived from the triple collocation. And in this case, we can see that SMAP observations contributes more than SMOS over majority of the continent in the state updating due to the relatively low error variances. And the second step is to impart mass conservation constraints on related states and flux, uh, fluxes, such as the root zone soil moisture elbow transpiration and stream flow using the tangent linear modeling to ensure the water balance uh, post assimilation. Now, um, turning to some of the main results I get here. The figure on the left compares the performance of model estimated surface soil moisture before and after the data simulation. The performance is evaluated using the Pearson correlation between the model uh, soil moisture and the, uh, in the ground measurements from uh, uh, three networks across in the continent. And the significant increase uh, in the correlation can be seen here after the data simulation, after the data simulation represented in the light blue color here, comparing to the model open loop without the simulation of satellite observations. Um, and this improvement is consistent over the three uh, networks. And this demonstrates the improvements in the estimating of soil moisture dynamics after the data simulation. And since the accurate initial conditions are very important in forecasting the avail water availability, we quantify the persistence of the correction from data simulation through driving the model forward using the analyzed states. What we found is that the impacts of data simulation can persist in the topsoil layer for almost one week um, and sometimes more than one month in the deeper soil layer. And uh, so this illustrates the potential gains we can get from data simulation in improving the water balance forecast. And the method that we have developed has now been used in the operational ORA system run by the Bureau of Meteorology for the seasonal forecasting. <laughs> And the model outputs will be available to the public soon and used in the next water, uh, next national water accounts. So I believe this is a good demonstration of better water management using Earth's observations. The second example I want to show here is the uh, forecasting drought impacts using the soil moisture information. So moisture is one of the most important variables for drought monitoring because soil preserves a memory for the weather anomalies, such as unusually high or low amounts of rainfall. And this persistence is greatest in the driest, region, driest regions. And another widely used drought indicator is vegetation indices. And the time series here uh, are the monthly rules on soil moisture estimates and the uh, observed vegetation greenness from the satellites over the southeast coast before the horrific black farmer fires in 2019. And both rules on soil moisture and vegetation greenness have shown a significant decreasing trend over this period. However, if we have a closer look at the time series here, we can see that um, the soil already starts drying up uh, two to three months before the visible decreasing trend in the vegetation greenness. Therefore, 
one of the drawbacks of the vegetation-based approach is that the drought is already quite advanced once water stress is visible in the vegetation cover. But we can use this relationship in the drought impact forecasting. Now, I would like to briefly introduce to you the key components of our proposed framework for the drought impact forecasting. And in this study, we assimilated three satellite observations, including the soil moisture from SMOS, total water storage from GRACE, and surface water extent from MODIS satellite. And those, uh, since those three satellite products uh, measure different uh, variables and have different spatial and temporal resolution, we used an ensemble common smoother with a one month window to provide the smooth daily model estimates retrospectively. And the goal of using these multiple satellite water observations is to provide optimal estimates of individual water storage components. And we then use the statistical relationship between the observed surface uh, greenness and the analyzed water storage anomaly after their simulation um, to forecast the future vegetation condition using a regression model. And the indicator for the vegetation condition we use is called NDVI, and it's a measure of the plant health um, based on how the plant reflects the light at certain frequencies. Our findings suggest that incorporating the current soil water availability specific to different vegetation type and aridity can significantly improve the accuracy of vegetation condition forecasts. The bottom maps here shows the lead time we can get for the accurate forecast of the vegetation condition using the soil moisture anomaly at different depths indicated in the top map here. And overall, we can see that over majority of the global drylands, we can forecast it three months in advance using the soil moisture information. And for grasslands and cropland area, where vegetation responds quickly to rainfall variability, the forecast uh, capability is limited to one month. And more importantly, what we found is that vegetation in the arid region tend to access uh, deeper water, uh, like water deeper in the soil. And the time series here are the example of the three months forecast we have uh, for the NDVI. And you can see the significant difference between the forecast using the soil water availability up to data simulation um, in red and comparing to the climatology forecast in blue. Um, this study demonstrated that uh, satellite measurements allowed us to predict how much longer the vegetation in a given region could continue growing before the soils run dry. And in this way, we can predict drought impacts before they happen and also improve the drought early warning system to enhance the timely decision making and forward planning by uh, farmers, fire agencies, and other land and water managers. And in addition to the previous two projects, I have been able to grow through my PhD work and to extend my collaboration network to different university and organizations through several external funded projects. And those projects cover model and algorithm development, data processing, as well as software and system development. Um, but more importantly, through these projects and the engagements with these different uh, industries and agencies, I gain a better understanding of the end user needs and the data requirements in the future water resources management and agriculture planning. So what I would like to focus in the next few years is the development of the space-based hyper-resolution eco-hydrological forecasting system that will enable the discovery of the new standings of our possible water futures and support the decision making at the property scale. And these will fill the gaps in the fine scale climate and hydrological condition information and support the on-ground decision making. And 
in my previous slides, you have, I have already seen the value of satellite Earth observations in water resources management and drought monitoring at large scale. However, none of these observations can be used by itself to provide the spatial details that are required in the agriculture sector. So what I aim for is a space-based integrated drought management system that can provide the real-time uh, consistent national-wide uh, ecohydrological information at property scale. And this will not include the soil moisture, but also other related variables such as self-transpiration, uh, groundwater, as well as crop yield to enable an informative decision-making. And the animation I show here shows the value of having a soil moisture information at 100 meter resolution comparing to the three pixels that we get for the same extent from satellite observations. And with a map like this, we can see the soil moisture variation across land cover types and even identify different irrigation events across the paddocks as well as the river channels. But it is a challenging job to achieve a map like this nationwide. And using techniques like data simulation is not enough to solve this problem. Therefore, what I would like to focus is the development of the novel techniques in the data processing and the data integration to best integrate this available information uh, from up-to-date Earth observations and biophysical modeling to maximize their usefulness in the water and agriculture sectors. And more importantly, I will focus on advancing the forecasting capability to provide accessible, accurate, and timely for hydrological forecasts. Ultimately, I hope um, everyone can easily get the information they need about water and make their own decisions. And having the uh, best information about our current and the near future water status is just the first step. And knowing how the decisions are made today in the context of uncertainties and iteratively refining the method and the system is very important. So I hope to work collaboratively with researchers within the institute and school, as well as policy and decision makers to best integrate these new techniques and observations in the future water decision making. Um, now I would like to finish my talk uh, with this painting from a child representing her imagination of our water future. And I really hope that our research will have a real impact on the way we use and reuse our scarce water supplies and limit the environmental impact manage and conserve the water for our future generations, but more importantly, to ensure the safety and the well-being of our community and the environment. Uh, thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Suan. That was a very interesting perspective, particularly the last uh, slide was <laughs> very nice. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, the floor is open for questions then, please. I can ask a quick question, Doran, because yes. I've got to head off by 10.30, but uh, by 11.30, sorry. Um, but I had a question about the, the forecasting. And to some extent, you, you know, you're reliant on the meteorological inputs, but yeah. we know that Bureau can't forecast rainfall more than a week ahead in advance. So, I mean, e even the seasonal predictions that they can make these days are very um, rudimentary. So, you know, to, to what extent can we really forecast drought given the limitation on the meteorological side of the models? Um, thank you, Andy, for the question. It's a very... Good question. Actually, yes, uh, most of the forecasting system depends on the precipitation. Uh, but what my point is here is to uh, like, because soil preserves the memory for all the weather anomalies, such as the precipitation and uh, temperatures, that's why we want to uh, focus on using the soil moisture in the forecasting of the drought, because um, it has a 
uh, like longer, um, like basically we're using the lag, uh, time lag between the soil moisture and the uh, water stress in the vegetation. That's why we can predict uh, the future uh, potential drought impacts that affect the vegetation like months in advance. And mm -hmm. but also having uh, a, a more um, also the, the, the previous uh, results that I show, uh, sorry, I have to skip first. Um, the, the impacts of data simulation is actually um, providing the best estimates of the current status. And so these uh, results that actually is using the same um, meteorological forcing. And, and then compare with the, um, like the only difference is using the original model estimates that without data simulation. So it's a, like we can say like, uh, it's not very accurate initial conditions comparing to a more accurate uh, initial conditions. So the difference is quite uh, significant in particular in the root zone soil moisture. So, so that's the, I think the main benefits of studying um, uh, like on ground instead of looking at just sky, like just the precipitation, uh, like forcing. I, I hope Thanks. that no questions. Very good answer. Thank you. Any other questions for C1? Yeah, I have a, a question, Siwan. You talked about um, conserving mass, yet yep. you're talking, you're dealing here with a system that doesn't necessarily conserve mass in a regional basis or a, a continental scale. So how can you impose a conservation of mass constraint here? Uh, actually, this model is, uh, is already a model uh, water balance modeling. So uh, the model itself conserves mass, but in traditional way of doing data simulation is we induce or rec uh, reduce the water from the system, which will cause the uh, uh, like mass imbalance. That's why uh, what we want is to have a mass conservation. So what I do here is using the um, tangent linear modeling to get like um, for uh, like the uh, to basically work out um, the the amount of water that I added or subtracted from the system can cause how much impacts on the other related uh, um, uh, variables, and this of course will depends on the model physics. So basically is, uh, for example, if I add 100, uh, like 10 mils of water into the topsoil layers, and what is the impacts of the transpiration and what it, or like what more we can get from, uh, for this uh, root zone soil moisture. That's what I'm trying to solve, like here. Um, and also uh, one of the, uh, the advanced thing that's apart from the most, um, uh, like like most of the way of doing data simulation. Okay, thank you. So we've got one in the chat before I come to you, Brad, as is Yanis here. I'm not sure if we will understand your question. I'll read it out, but you might have to pipe it with some explanation. Okay. Is, it, is it possible to tamper with the satellite measurements and how, and how do you ensure the robustness and accuracy of the measurements? Um, yeah. uh, if, I, if I may, uh, you may. Are... <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, how, how can you make sure that the signals you get are, are not tampered with, like that your satellite is not, and, and, that, and that can be either from uh, uh, like some unrelated and unforeseen phenomenon, or it could be malevolent human action. I mean, that's something that we should have in mind and prepare for. And the, 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 the corollary to that is 
how do you make sure that the ground conditions do not change with the satellite measures? For example, if I put a huge, let's say, tarp over uh, a huge, let's say, a big surface, then you will be measuring a reflection. How do you know, how are you going to interpret this signal, which reflects different conditions on the ground that you are assuming? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, so actually, uh, we these the, like what I showed. Sorry, I need to. Uh, so what I showed before here is like uh, the uh, observed signal. Actually, like for example, of the uh, cell I measured uh, brightness temperature, it of course have a lot of impact from the atmospheres and also like like uh, vegetation uh, uh, structures. So it's not actually the signal that uh, we want in the soil. So we have to use like uh, models like radio trans radiative transfer model to, to get the soil moisture signals from the satellite measurements. And also, uh, because since we all know that observations are not perfect as well, so that's why uh, the main benefits of data simulation techniques is it considers the errors in the observations. For example, if these, um, if we validate our uh, satellite observations, we uh, with uh, 10 mils of arrows in these measurements, and we can consider these ones in the um, data simulation process, and then to have a more realistic uh, estimates, um, like using this together with the model forecast. And um, that's why, uh, like, I think uh, techniques like data simulation or uh, even machine learning has, uh, uh, like, uh, much more, like, has the future to improve our understanding in the um, water status. I, I hope I answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Suyuan. Yes, very, very good answer. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Brad, your question? On you now. There we go. Um, yeah, I was, I was wondering, wonderful talk, by the way, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you think about how groundwater translates, or how soil moisture translates into groundwater recharge, mm. if you do. What's your favorite algorithm? Um, that's a good point. And it's like, um, it's very like, uh, as far as the models that I like have worked with, the, the coupling between the soil moisture and ground comp uh, groundwater components is always uh, not accurate. So for most of the models that we evaluated, like the groundwater components, uh, um, like estimation is always very poor. So this is definitely um, a good, uh, like a part that we need to work on. And the, the uh, one of the benefits of using like techniques like the data simulation or new uh, new observations is that it can actually um, mitigate this problem. For example, uh, the studies that I had before using the uh, simulation of GRACE data is because it actually consider, uh, has the signals that including uh, soil moisture and the uh, groundwater uh, storage variations. And majority of these uh, signal comes from the groundwater. And if we incorporate these observations in the uh, modeling, we, we can like mitigate the uh, efficiencies in the model physics, as well as also include the, um, the signals that caused by human inventions, such as water pumpings. And but absolutely, there is. Uh, it is not enough to just uh, like bring the um, water uh, observations from the space. We have to improve the the modeling. Um, 
And for example, the model I use here does not consider any lateral, uh, lateral distributions of water, and this is definitely needed for the uh, groundwater monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any? Ah, Louis. Okay, uh, there is a chat question um, which says, "Can the data assimilation framework incorporate other types of observations?" I'm thinking about the recent DECRA project of changing Jiang to use 4D ambient noise seismology. Yes, I think uh, data simulation is quite powerful. It has been used um, in uh, like various problems. Like it started in the atmospheric like uh, uh, problems that helps our weather predictions, and I have seen also they use this uh, the techniques in even uh, like seismologies and even like uh, like uh, geochemistry. So I think it's a powerful tool to. Um, to tackle the problem that if we want to understand what we didn't see, like um, like in this way, if we have a dynamic model and we have observations, we can definitely use the data simulation to, to have a more realistic and um, uh, better estimates of the, uh, the, the, the variable that you're interested in. Okay. And happy to chat later if uh, there is uh, any, uh, potential collaboration with these DECRA projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Siwan. Um, thank you. So I can't see any more raised hands or more questions in the chat, and we're slightly over time. It is uh, very nice chatting to you, and I can see there's a lot of interest uh, question-wise on your talk, which is always thank nice. Um, but uh, Given that we're, uh, we're done here and there are no more questions, uh, thank you all very much for attending. Thank you very much, Siwan, for, for giving us that uh, very um, interesting talk. And I wish you all a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.